Welcome to this video conference coverage program highlighting key data on multi-cancer early detection presented at the 2024 American Association for Cancer Research Annual Meeting in San Diego, California. The 2024 American Society of Clinical Oncology Annual Meeting in Chicago, Illinois and the 2024 National Comprehensive Cancer Network Annual Conference in Orlando, Florida. In this series of six chapters, our experts, internal medicine physician Richard Whittington and oncologist Gautam Agarwal will discuss the most recent data on MSED tests presented at these oncology conferences, including clinical trial data, real-world experience, and post hoc analyses from previous clinical trials, modeled benefits of MSED test usage, novel tests in development, and the impact of MSED screening on quality of life and health and screening disparities. Before the conference coverage begins, Dr. Whittington will provide some background information on MSED science and its current and potential future use in clinical practice. I'm Richard Whittington. I'm a physician here in Salt Lake City, Utah. I've been practicing for 26 years, both intensive care, hospital, as well as outpatient medicine. Approximately five years ago, I was involved with the Pathfinder study, a multi-cancer early detection study, um, as a site lead, and that's how I got involved um, with multi-cancer early detection. Cancer, unfortunately, is the second leading cause of death in our country. 40% of us will have a cancer in our lifetimes, and unfortunately, 70% of Americans are not up to date on at least one routine cancer screening. We have over 600,000 people die each year in our, in our country from cancer. Overall, the five-year survival from any malignancy between 2014 and 2020 is 69%, showing we are doing good with the treatment of cancer. There is a five-year relative survival rate is at least three times higher for tumors detected at a localized stage than when detected at a distant stage. Cancer detection at earlier stages reduces mortality. So hopefully we all know these, but these are cancer screenings that we are currently supposed to do and hopefully all of our patients are getting and we're working hard on getting them to have them. Of interest, several leading causes of death that make 11% of cancers, ovarian, pancreatic, testicular, and thyroid cancers are not being screened and actually current recommendations are against screening for them. We have had success with cancer screening. Glad to say that all of our interventions and hard work with our patients does pay off. We have age reduction mortality rates between 2013 and 2022 of 1.2% reduction in breast cancer deaths annually, cervical cancer of 0.7%, colorectal of 1.7%, and lung cancer of 4.1% annually. Unfortunately, there's disparities in screening. They come for many reasons. Many of them are socioeconomic as there's a huge disparity between the haves and the have-nots. If you have a lower socioeconomic status and a, and a greater poverty level, you don't get as many screenings done. And unfortunately, race and ethnicity are the same way with risk of death compared to white patients, 33% higher for black patients and 51% higher for indigenous, indigenous American patients, of which I see several of in Utah. So what are our limitations of our current screening? One limitation is we're only screening one organ at a time, and so therefore we're asking our patients to get many screens. Unfortunately, even with those screens, only 25% of diagnosed cancers are detected. 58% of all cancers that cause death are not even screened for in our current modalities. I bring this slide up to move us forward towards multi-cancer early detection. Um, as you start to screen for multiple cancers, with one screening test, we get the advantage of aggregate prevalence. Um, if we look at this, the graph on the left, you can see colorectal, dead center. And the number needed to screen is 167, and colonoscopies are not cheap. So we've already, as a country, accepted that number as kind of a goal that we're willing to spend to screen for cancer. If we look to the left, some highly deadly cancers, pancreas, liver, stomach, and esophagus, those cancers, unfortunately, are invasive to screen, costly to screen and have such a low incidence that we don't actually um, screen those. But if we had a pan-GI cancer screening, we could get only 83 people as number needed to screen to actually find a cancer. 
And if we had a test that screened for all cancers, we would be only have to screen 33 people to find a cancer, and that's a 3% prevalence rate in our country. Our other graph here looks at the idea of prevalence rate. Now I'll jump to that idea of a universal test along with specificity. So if we had a test that was 99% specific with a 3% prevalence rate, we could get a positive predictive value or a true positive test in the high 60 or low 70% range. So modeling has looked at um, our can current cancer screening and added in this idea of multi-cancer early detection. And if you look at each population that's screened, whether it's strictly for colon cancer or lung cancer or breast cancer, you can see that you would be able to catch a lot more cancers if you would add in additional cancers to that initial screening. So for example, if you do a colorectal screen, you'll find 90 cancers. But if you were screening those patients for all types of cancer at the same time, you could get 12 times as many other cancers, up to 1,067 diagnosed. If we could add multi-cancer early detection to conventional screening, we could diagnose as many as three times the cancers that we are diagnosing with our current screening alone. This would catch some of the 58% of cancers that we're not screening at all. Interestingly, if we could do this at a consistent basis with all of our patients, we could lower the death mortality rate approximately 17% from all cancers per year. In hard numbers, if you remember back to what I said about having 600,000 patients in the United States die per year, this could be as many as 100,000 patients per year saved. Cost would decrease too when you put multiple cancer screenings together and not have to expand them, you would have um, some significant cost savings. The science of multi-cancer early detection um, is something that we're gonna move forward towards now. Um, when you think of our current type of screening, we uh, do a screening test. Sometimes it is diagnostic in and of itself. Sometimes it requires an additional intensive invasive test to um, diagnose it. But basically, we have to visualize it. We have to find it. It's potentially costly. And if it's in the lung, for example, risky and potentially painful. And then it will only add detailed information about that cancer at that specific time if you can um, get to the site and get the biopsy. Whereas a blood-based biopsy is non-invasive, um, it potentially can characterize the tumor across all stages. It can give us real-time diagnosis about um, extent of the cancer, the metastasis, and the prognosis. And even afterwards, you can follow levels and potentially monitor the potential treatment response. So how do these multi-cancer early detection tests work? Um, basically, it's a lot of, it's AI, it's machine learning, and it's some really interesting new science. Um, it's based on cell-free DNA, which has been around for 20 years through multiple studies, and um, now we're able to use it in this modality. Specifically, cellular material, including cell-free DNA and proteins, are released into the bloodstream from cancers through apoptosis, necrosis, and secretion. Methylation changes are, are one of the largest that um, cell-free DNA is hit on, but there are others, and they're all being used to increase sensitivity and specificity of our cancer screening. Cancer is associated with many epigenetic changes, DNA methylation being one of them. DNA methylation will change the three-dimensional conformation of the genome. It changes the protein-DNA interactions, expression patterns, and so forth. Changes in DNA methylation patterns can contribute to tumor genesis or progression of cancers and can be identified and characterized via next generation sequencing and machine learning. So there are several tests now, multi-cancer early detection test assays that are out there that have received FDA breakthrough device designation. The ones you may hear of are CancerSeq, Oversee, Gallery, and CanScan. To get to the nitty gritty, of multi-cancer early detection, we're all gonna have to go back to our medical school days and remember some very important statistics so that we are using these tests appropriately on appropriate um, groups and making sure that we understand what the tests are telling us and not telling us. Specifically, sensitivity, which we probably all remember, is the ability to catch a true positive test. Specificity is the ability of a test to catch a true negative test. Positive predictive value is your positive, true positives over positives. It gives you the percentage of which tests are actually true positives. And negative predictive value is the reverse, telling us is a test truly negative. So using these specific 
statistical analysis, we can now look at the multi-cancer early detection tests that are out there study-wise and take a hard look and see whether or not they may actually be usable. As you can see, the specificity is fantastic. Uh, across all the tests out there, we are at 98 to 99.5. Now they need to be fantastic, right? Because even if you have a test that tests for all cancers, the incidence in our country is only 3%. So for example, if you have a 99.5% specific test, that still means one in 200 people are gonna be testing falsely positive. With a low incidence rate, you're still only gonna have uh, one per hundred or so that will be testing true positive. So it's critical that there's a very high specificity. The main reason why it's critical is we want to make sure we're not having unnecessary workups, we're not over-diagnosing, and we're certainly not over-treating. The high sensitivity is a bonus. The higher it is, the more cancers we catch. Of course, we would love it at 100, but anything more than 1% is still an improvement on where we've been. And as you can see, the sensitivity of these tests um, has a big range, but many of them are in nearly the 50% class. I would like to point out um, several of these tests are out there and the, one of the concerns ongoing with the tests is the idea that they're diagnosing cancer at a phase that's too late to make interaction. There's no doubt that, that, that a, a proportion of each of these sensitivities is at an advanced stage. But still, 40% in the CCGA and over 40% in Pathfinder, for example, were caught in stage one through three at a chance we really can have a positive interaction. So once again, another statistical way to look at the test is negative predictive value, and we definitely want a high negative predictive value, and you can see that these are all very high, but once again, necessary, like I said before, because of our low incidence in our country, and um, positive predictive value will take all we can get, and hopefully over time, each of these types of cancers uh, screenings can improve with additional machine learning, but right now, they're all in the range of what we would see with our other cancer screening. One last piece of multi-cancer early detection screening, which is an add-on and is very interesting, is this idea of cancel signal of origin, that the test not only predicts cancer in general, but gives us an analysis to guide us to the workup for where the actual cancer is in the body. It is not perfect, but as you can see, it's eight to nine out of 10 that the cancer test itself leads us to the diagnosis in the body. What we've learned about cell-free DNA-based multi-cancer early detection so far is that they compare very favorably to our screening tests already. You can see that screening mammography is specificity is 88.9% and the meta-analysis of cell-free DNA is at 97.8%. Sensitivities range for our different current screening and that the sensitivity of multi-cancer early detection testing is 65%, which is in the range of the other testing. So based on what we're already doing, this would seem like it's reaching the levels that can be effective and helpful in diagnosing early stage cancer that is helpful to save lives. So how would we implement multi-cancer early detection into primary care? When we think about this, we have to think a little bit about the advantages of multi-cancer early detection and the disadvantages. Some advantages, um, we could increase detection rate of all cancers, making earlier diagnosis and potentially saving lives. We can definitely screen for multiple cancers at the same time. Some disadvantages are um, interesting. Currently, multi-cancer early detection is not covered by insurance. And this is going to be very important going forward. If it is covered eventually, then we could actually decrease disparities um, based on economics because it'll be easier for people to get the test at a single visit with a doctor and it'd be cheaper than running every test for the patient. The disadvantage will be if it doesn't get covered, then only the wealthy will be able to get this test. Some other disadvantages would be that the, a cancer detected doesn't always mean there's a cancer. A no cancer detected doesn't mean there's always not a cancer. So what is the accessibility of multi-cancer early detection testing currently? Well, currently there is one test gallery 
which is out there and available to the general public, but it is $950 per test. At the current time, there are Medicare Multi-Cancer Early Detection Screening Coverage Acts going both through the House and Senate, but they haven't been passed yet. There's the Cancer Moonshot Initiative, which is goal is to cut cancer um, death by within the next 25 years by 50%, and they are looking at the utility and benefits of multi-cancer early detection tests in this initiative. There's other evaluations ongoing as well. Some of the important ones are, in my mind, in my opinion, the ones that decrease the disparage between our indigent populations, our racially um, diverse populations, and the socioeconomic populations. REACH initiative is um, basically covering the gallery test for 50,000 Medicare beneficiaries across all those populations. And hopefully this will add additional data that can um, help promote this type of screening and decrease the differences in death rates between all of those groups. How does the test actually work? Um, first, you have to figure out whether a patient should be eligible. Patients over 50 years old, family of or personal history of cancer, a history of childhood cancer, known genetic mutations, also people who are at high risk through smoking and other cancer-causing lifestyles. Who is not eligible? Pediatric populations younger than 21, pregnant patients, and pa patients who have active cancer in the past three years. There is um, pre-test counseling. You need to talk to the patients about their test beforehand, letting them know that not, it's not going to catch all cancers. Um, and even if they have a negative test, it doesn't 100% rule out the idea that they don't have a cancer or that they won't get a cancer in the future. For those patients who are still interested and are willing to pay whatever cost in their environment they have to pay, up to the $950, multi-cancer early detection tests can be ordered. Multi-cancer early detection processing is quite easy, actually. It's a couple blood samples, generally one or two vials of blood that need to be gathered, um, packaged in a box, and sent off to a lab. And generally within two weeks, the physician gets the report back and the report's pretty straightforward saying no cancer signal detected or that there is cancer signal detected and often lists one or two locations in the body where the cancer may be. So what do we do if there's a positive cancer signal test detected? We generally have to move to an additional workup to make sure to confirm that the cancer is, is present. Those workups could be to refer to a patient to an oncologist to do the workup or on your own to move forward. If we're moving forward, um, I don't see this as being very different than what I've done with my patients for the past 25 years. If the patient was having difficulty swallowing, for instance, I would be worried that they have an esophageal cancer and I would do an endoscopy. Um, I think that that makes sense for symptoms. It would also make sense if you have a blood test back that points to esophageal cancer. Pancreas, uh, CAT scan with IV contrast, perhaps an MRCP. Ovary to start with an ultrasound of the abdomen. Lung, a chest CT with or without contrast. Liver, ultrasound CT, potentially a GI referral, and so forth. I, I think that the uh, valuations of these cancers we've all done with um, symptoms before, and we would just plug in the first piece, which would be a blood test that says there's a cancer in these areas, and then move for towards our routine type evaluations.